If you bow your heads with me and, uh, and we'll pray in the beginning of the lecture. Father, as we approach this lesson, we realize that this book contains some hard truths. We pray that you would humble our hearts to receive them and that you would convict us where we need to be convicted. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my body would be pleasing in your sight as I give this lecture. In your name we pray. Amen. In the 15th year of Amaziah, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Jehoash, or Jeroboam II, became king in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Jeroboam I, which he had caused Israel to commit. The Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering. There was no one to help them. And since the Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam the second, or Jeroboam the son of Jehoash. That last bit sounds great, doesn't it? God is faithful to his rebellious people, and he raises up a king to deliver them, even if that king is an evil king. And that deliverer reigns for 41 years, which is the longest reign of any of the kings of the northern kingdom. It even says in 2 Kings 14.25 that he restored the borders of the northern kingdom back to what they would have been in Solomon's day, with the obvious exception of the southern territory of Judah. This was a time of economic prosperity for the northern kingdom, the golden age of Jeroboam II. And yet, things were not as they might seem. In Exodus 2, God had seen the suffering of his people in Egypt and had heard their cries and sent a deliverer to them. And he had done so here as well. But we will find that this deliverer did not rule with justice and righteousness. No. In his golden age, the old adage was undeniably true. The poor stayed poor. The rich got richer. But God saw this, and as Amos begins his prophecy to the northern kingdom, in chapter 1, verse 2, the Lord, the lion, roars from Jude Jerusalem in the south. And in the face of his wrath, the pastures of Carmel, at the far northern expanse of the northern kingdom, wither. I'm calling this lecture, The Pass-Through. I have two divisions. The first division is titled The Lion Roars, and it covers all of the book of Amos, with the exception of the last five verses. I want you to imagine the scene as Amos begins to preach these messages. Beginning in chapter 1, he begins to condemn all the nations around Israel for essentially their war crimes. But then, in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 2, he begins to condemn Judah for Judah's, the southern kingdom's, rejection of his law. And I'm sure that as the people of the northern kingdom came us up to this point, he would have had quite the hearty response. They would have loved it. But then he turns to his audience in 2 verse 6. And he says, for three of your sins and for four, I will not relent. Because you sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. And you can imagine the audience, which only a moment ago was likely lively and exuberant, is now deathly still. In the Mosaic Law, there was a prescription for those who had fallen upon hard times financially to basically lend themselves out as slaves or indentured servants in order to pay off their debts. But this was in extreme conditions. And even then, those slaves were supposed to go free every seven years, according to the law. Unfortunately, though, there is no record that Israel ever observed the law of the seventh year. And in fact, Scripture even seems to indicate specifically that they did not. But we're not talking about major debt now in our text. We are talking about a poor man having to sell themselves into slavery because they couldn't afford a pair of shoes. 
And if we jump over to chapter eight, Amos gives us the mindset of these rich individuals beginning in verse four. Hear this, you who trample the needy, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be over that we may market wheat? so that we can skimp on the measures and boost the price and cheat with dishonest scales. In other words, dishonestly sell the food at a higher rate than it's much higher rate than it's worth and buy things at a dishonestly at a much lower rate than they're worth. And they continue buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. And that's referring to the threshing process. Basically, there were two parts to the grain the wheat, which was the food part, and the chaff, which was the casing and was worthless. So they are weighing the chaff, the worthless part, along with the wheat so that they can sell more product that actually contains less food. And not only that, but then the buyer would have to do the work of separating that out themselves. So the rich were skimping on all fronts. They were using improper measures to start with, and then they were boosting the price artificially while skimping on the cost of labor for the threshing. Meanwhile, the poor man is spending more money to get less product, which means he just has to buy more to feed his family. And what happens when he can't do it anymore? Well, that's fine, says the rich man. You can go work for it in my sweatshop. See, God had delivered Israel from oppression by the hands of Jeroboam II, but under his rule, it was only the rich who were benefiting from this golden age. The rest were even more oppressed than they had been before. And God has seen it and is not pleased. Back to 2 verse 7, chapter 2 verse 7, they trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. We find from other places in the book that when the poor man went to court to try to get justice for this oppression, the judges were able to be bribed by those who were rich. So there's no way out of this for them. And then we get to the type of description of the type of religious sin that the people were involved in. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. The language there makes it most likely that what's in view here is them going to a cult prostitute which then carries into verse 8 of chapter 2. So you have father and son going to this cult prostitute. And what do they do? They lay them down beside the altar and they commit their sex act there on garments taken in pledge. Don't miss that. According to Exodus 22, if a poor man had nothing to pay back a loan with, they were able to give their coat in pledge. However, the one they were giving it to had a responsibility to give it back at night because it gets cold in that part of the world and the poor man would need it for a blanket. So father and son are committing the sex act with a cult prostitute and what are they using to do it on? The garment that has been taken from the poor man that they did not get back. Meanwhile, that poor man is shivering out in the cold, unable to keep warm. And while they are committing this act, they work up a thirst, so they drink wine taken as fines. Again, an interjection. Fines were prescribed in the Mosaic Law, but they were always a prescription designed to make compensation for a loss. So let's say I killed your ox. I would have to pay a fine to compensate for that loss, with the idea that with it, you would then buy a new ox. So... In what world is such a thing going to be used to buy wine? Did the poor man break into a wine cellar and start doing some damage? That's pretty unlikely. No, we get another view into the system of justice. Let's make new laws and new fines so that we can continue to steal money from the poor people. After all, we wouldn't want our party money to dip into the proceeds of our already corrupt sales, would we? Do you see the compounded evil of the sins that the northern kingdom is committing? Well, God does too. God says, wait a minute. I destroyed the Amorites before you. I brought you up from out of oppression in Egypt. 
keep the Exodus in mind because we'll come back to it. And I gave you the land of the Amorites. Remember them? This is chap the, continuing in chapter two, by the way. Those people that you were so afraid of back in Numbers 13 that you wouldn't trust me to defeat them? Well, the Israelites had been afraid of them and God destroyed them, which begs the question, why weren't they afraid of him? Moving into chapter 3, hear this word, people of Israel, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. You only have I known out of all the nations of the world. And we can imagine Amos's audience now breathing a sigh of relief. Oh, good. They might say, we have some hope. God's gracious. He'll forgive us. Everything's going to be okay. We have nothing to worry about. But that's not what Amos says. He says instead, you only have I known of all the families of the earth, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, I will punish you for all of your sins. Do we, do we think that our special status as God's people gives us a get-out-of-jail-free card to commit as much iniquity as we want? Not on your life. This is a lesson we need to take note of today. The sacrifice of, sin, of Christ does not give us license to commit sin. Quite the opposite, in fact. In the, book, in the first several chapters of the book of Amos, he had called out the other nations surrounding Israel for basically their war crimes. But against Israel and Judah, he condemns them for a failure to keep his word. No. The New Testament lays out the principle that, that to whom much is given, much is required. These people have the word of God, and so they have a greater guilt than the nations round about. Do you realize that, Christian? The church of our day is taking great sport in bewailing the evil of our culture around us. Good job. Now, there's a place for that, of course. But let's examine our hearts. Is it possible that the reason we point out evil in the unbelieving culture around us so much is that when we do so, it becomes easier to ignore our own evil? Is it really just our pride and self-righteousness talking, if we're honest? Here's the problem, though. That unbelieving culture around us, they don't believe the word of God. We do. Or at least we claim to. What did Jesus say in Luke 12? That the slave who did not know his master's will will receive a few lashes. But the one who knew his master's will and did not do it will receive many lashes. Friend, do you realize that your sins as a Christian are worse than the sins of an unbeliever? Why is that? It's because you should know better. So God says, you only have I known out of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all of your sins. As Peter says, judgment begins at the house of God. Then in the next few verses of chapter 3, Amos lays out a series of rhetorical questions that have obvious answers. The reason for this is to build up the emphasis upon his final question. Beginning then in verse 3 of chapter 3, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? No, that doesn't happen. They either meet beforehand or they meet up along the way and continue on together. Does a lion roar in the thicket when it has taken no prey? No, that's not what happens. A lion will stalk its prey totally silently until it, it, and it will not roar and until it is springing upon its prey and it is too late for the prey to escape. Does it growl in its den when it has caught nothing? No. Does a bird swoop it down into a trap on the ground when there is no bait in the trap? No, why would it do such a thing? Does a trap spring up from the ground if it has not caught anything? No, there's no reason for that. When a trumpet sounds in the city, do not the people tremble? Of course, the whole point of a trumpet in those days was that it would sound the alarm when danger was near. What's your point, Amos? Here it is, the point he has been building to. Does disaster come upon a city if the Lord has not caused it? 
What's the answer? No. God says, I want you to be absolutely clear about this. When judgment comes upon a nation or upon a city or whatever, I am the cause. Did you think that he was a God that just showers blessings upon people and never acts in judgment? He is not just the sacrificial lamb that provides atonement for sin. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the lion has roared. Remember, that's how the book opened in chapter 1, verse 2. And we just were asked in verse 4, does a lion roar in the thicket when it has taken no prey? And the answer was no. Amos is describing God as if he is a lion in mid-pounce about to tear the nation to shreds. And he furthermore says that the prophets have had this revealed to them. It is as if they are the trumpets on the wall. And remember verse 6, when a trumpet sounds in the city, do not the people tremble? But instead, we learned in chapter 2, verse 12, that the prophets were sounding the alarm, but the people told them to shut up. This lion is in midair, about to take its prey, and this gazelle just stands there, totally ignoring the roar. He then calls in verse 9 for Egypt to observe the oppression within the nation. Egypt, the nation that has oppressed them, that oppressed them back in the Exodus, that God had delivered them from. Egypt, come here, come check this out. You can learn something about oppression from my people. Here's another thing to take note of. In chapter 1, God had condemned those nations around Israel for essentially war crimes, but those things were all things that happened on basically one occasion. By contrast, these crimes of Israel were things that were taking place constantly. Imagine that imagery from chapter 2 that I described taking place every Friday night. You can be the judge. Which is worse? God says, move over, Egypt. There's a new slave master in town. And it's my people, Israel, the very ones who should have known better. And they have plundered and looted and oppressed the poor of the land. Therefore, verse 11 of chapter 3, I am going to do the same to you. You, Israel, have plundered and oppressed, but now you will be plundered and oppressed. This lion is about to take its prey, and it says, As the shepherd rescues from a lion's mouth only two leg bones or the piece of an ear, so that's going to be what's left of you when I'm through with you. I am going to destroy you. Well, maybe the reaction might have been that they could have just been more religious in order to avoid God's wrath which is what Amos chap tackles next. But the reality is that our religious activity cannot make up for the sin of our lives. And God says in chapter 5, verse 22, even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. You bring me the best of the best fellowship offerings, I don't care. Get away from me. Your songs are no just noise. I hate your music. Do you know what I want? He asks, essentially. I, 5 verse 24, I want your life not to be characterized by the evil of chapter 2, an ongoing week in and week out abomination of indulgence and oppression. But instead, 5 verse 24, I want your life to be characterized by an ongoing, ever ending streak of justice and righteousness. Jumping to chapter 6. Right now, your lives are characterized by indulgence and complacency. As you strum about on your hearts like harps like royalty, verse 5, as you dine on choice meat and lounge on your couch, and you drink wine in bowls and use the finest products on your skin, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. What's he talking about there? The ruin of Joseph. Well, it goes back to Genesis 37. Do you remember what happened when Joseph went out and met with his brothers? They were jealous of him and took his coat, just like Israel was stealing the garments of the poor people. 
And then they threw Joseph in a pit to die. But what did they do then? It says in Genesis 37 that they sat down to eat and indulge themselves. While Joseph was meanwhile certainly screaming from the bottom of the pit. And they paid him no heed. And then they sold him into slavery when the Midianites came by. Amos says to the northern kingdom, that's who you are. You live high on the hog, but you have done so by theft and oppression and by selling my people into slavery. And you totally ignore the cries of my people that you have oppressed. The cries which God takes note of. Well, you want to oppress people like Egypt, then I'll treat you like Egypt. Back to 5 verse 17, there will be wailing in the streets and vineyards. Why? Because I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. Exodus 12 records an important event, the Passover. When God killed the firstborn in all the land of Egypt and rescued his people from slavery, it says he passed over his people, which is how the event gets its name. But it says in Exodus 12 also that he would pass through the land of Egypt. The very same phrase he uses in 5 verse 17 of Amos. You are oppressing my people, and I am going to come in judgment against you for it. Why did they do this to the poor people? It was because of their pride. They thought themselves to be better than those below them on the totem pole. And they used them to indulge themselves. And so God says in 6 verse 8 that he abhors the pride of Jacob and that he would deliver them up. And jumping to 8 verse 7, he swears by himself that he will never forget anything that they have done. What a terrifying thought. The same God who promises his people that he will wipe every tear from their eyes and remember their sins no more now says to these people that he will never forget anything that they have done. That's the sad reality of future judgment for those who have not trusted in God. We see it in Revelation 20 where it says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated upon it, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Every deed, every sin, every violation of the law of God, never forgotten. And it says that anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. It is only those whose name is found written in the book of life who are spared. Those who truly trust in the true God. But these people have rejected his word and his prophets. And so it will be taken from them. Amos 8 verse 11. The days are coming when I will send a famine through the land, not of food or of water, but of hearing of the word of God. The very source of deliverance will be taken away. And that's what happened to the northern kingdom. The golden age was about to come to an end. Even as the reign of Jeroboam II came to a close, the nation of Assyria was on the rise, and they would come, and they would wipe the northern kingdom off the face of the earth. It happened about 40 years after Amos gave his message. And do you know who caused it? God did. Who says in 9 verse 4 that he will look upon them for harm, literally for evil in the Hebrew, and not for good. After all, 3 verse 6, it said, does disaster come to a city if the Lord has not caused it? The lion of the tribe of Judah had roared, but they had not listened. Instead, though they claimed to be the people of God, by their actions they denied it. And instead, they refused to repent and turn to him. And they were destroyed. My principle is this. If we claim to be a child of God, then our lives must match our profession. If we claim to be a child of God, then our lives must match our profession.
does yours. Yet, Amos does not end his prophecy there. So I can't either. My second division is titled The Lion's Share. And it covers the last five verses of the book of Amos. But I'm going to be start to start by turning to Isaiah chapter 9. A great Christmas passage. Which reads, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, which were the first tribes to be taken into exile, in the area you might be more familiar with by another name. But in the future, he will have honor Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Why? For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and hold, upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And Amos 9.11 says, in that day, I will restore David's fallen tabernacle. That's the word tent there. It is divided at the time of Amos into the northern and southern kingdoms. And David line, David's line would also be taken into captivity, as we'll see later in our study of the divided kingdom. But Amos says that one day the line of David will be restored. And the genealogy of Matthew tells us that that is the case in the person of Jesus Christ. But Amos calls it a tabernacle of David, which John testifies to when he says the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. In Revelation 5, John saw a vision and he says that, it, and he says there that I saw in the hand of him who sat upon the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And just to interject some background for a moment, Roman last will and testaments were written in this way and sealed in this manner. This is God's last will and testament. We are talking about God's inheritance. As one commentator put it, this is the title deed to the universe. And an angel proclaimed, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one could open the scroll or even look inside. And John says he wept because he, no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. But then one of the elders said to him, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. And John looked to see this lion. And he saw a lamb standing as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. And he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. And Amos says that he will restore the kingdom as it used to be, one kingdom, no longer divided, under one king, the son of David, Jesus Christ. And it says that they will possess the remnant of Edom. Don't miss that. Who is Edom? They were the descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother, of whom the 12 tribes of Israel were born. God says, it's too small a thing for me to just reunite the 12 tribes of Israel in my kingdom. No. I'm going to go back farther than that. I'm going to bring back the tribe of, tribes of Esau as well. But that's not all. God says he's going to gather the remnant of all the nations that bear his name. God says it's too small a thing for me to only regather my people Israel. I'm going to bring back Edom. And I'm going to bring back China. And I'm going to bring back Russia. And I'm going to bring back Germany. And I'm going to bring back America. And in case you doubt it, he declares that it is him. He says, I, Yahweh, the great I am, will do these things. And the days are coming when it will be so prosperous that you won't even be able to finish harvesting your grain before it's time to plant again. Harvest time normally took about two weeks. God is saying that the land is going to be so abundant that the six months before the time to sow won't be enough to gather at all. The one sowing is going to be tripping over the one harvesting in the field that's still working. Forget about trying to get all the wine. 
There's going to be so much wine that the hills are going to flow with it. You couldn't contain it if you tried. And he will bring back his people from exile. And they will plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. Which is a reversal of the curses of Deuteronomy that Amos had laid out in 5 verse 11. God says that in that day he will plant Israel in their land, never to be uprooted from the land that he is giving to them. And let's remember the principle of 3 verse 6. Does disaster come upon a city unless the Lord has caused it? What was the answer? No. So what's the corollary? Friends, if God says that they will never be uprooted, then they won't ever be uprooted. And because he knows you would find it hard to believe, he ends the word, book with these words. It says Yahweh, your God. That you're there is singular. He's talking to each of us. If Yahweh is your God, you will see this day. So, what do we do then? 1 Peter 1.13 informs us, Therefore, with minds that are alert and sober, set your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to us when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. My principle is this. The believer lives not for this world, but for the return of the Lord. The believer lives not for this world, but for the return of the Lord. Father, through your prophet Amos, you share, you show us many hard truths. We pray that you would use this Christmas season to reflect, reflect upon those truths of your word and that you would bring us back in several weeks to hear from you again. We thank you and praise you for the gift that you have given to us that is greater than we will ever receive, the gift of your son. And we celebrate that in this time. We praise your name. Amen. Amen.